Austin, Texas, 1884, a city that was on the very edge of modernity, a city that had grown in population by almost five times in the last 20 years. Some even called it the Athens of the West. Indeed, there were not one, not two, but three different universities that you could study at. You could buy one of the 10,000 books located at Gamble's, the downtown bookstore, and sunset red granite was being laid as the foundation of what would become the Texas state capital, a capital that I might add is bigger than the U.S. capital. Granite, in fact, that still emits trace amounts of radiation, even still today, right now. Children were known to ride around town on velocipeds, known now as bicycles. But among the life springing forth in Texas's capital city was a midnight monster determined to end it. This was a murderer so unusually violent and random that some would dub him America's first serial killer. Welcome to Margs and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, make sure you are of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Today's case, the case of the Servant Girl Annihilators, I became fascinated by, um, sort of tangentially, in fact, by something that may have been an impact of this murder. I have, since I moved to Austin almost 15 years ago, had maybe one might call an unhealthy obsession with Austin's moon towers. Yes, the same moon towers that Matthew McConaughey had a party by in Dazed and Confused. I love the moon towers so much that I have a poster about them hanging in my bedroom. 31 moon towers were purchased by the city of Austin in 1894 after they had been decommissioned by the city of Detroit. They stand a regal 165 feet tall, and they have six lamps that were once illuminated by a bright carbon arc. Workers had to ride a pulley system up the 165 feet every single day in order to change the bulbs. They illuminated a 1,500 square foot circle bright enough for someone to see their watch. Today, the 17 that remain in Austin, Texas, are the only ones still standing in the world and they remain a curiosity and in fact are on the National Register of Historic Items, Objects, <laughs> Landmarks. The most famous moon tower, the one located in Zilker Park, is known for forming the Zilker Park Christmas tree each Christmas season. But how do moon towers relate to today's crime? Well, stay tuned. Another Austin favorite is the Mexican Martini. Created in the 1980s, its origin, as usual, is under some hot debate. This drink is a great combination of carbonation, sweet, olivey, lime juicy goodness, and I'm sure once you try it, you will add it to your regular margarita rotation. Oh, just me? So for this drink, we started with two parts tequila and added to that one part Sprite, two parts triple sec, one part lime juice, and a splash of olive juice. We took all of the ingredients, mixed them in a shaker, strained over fresh ice in a salt-rimmed glass, and I garnish mine with an olive. But uh, take it from me, there's a reason that they um, garnish these with a toothpick. My olive is in the bottom like a, like a cherry limeade. I, I, I guess a treat for the end. Before we begin, I'll just say outright that I do not think that the Servant Girl Annihilator was America's first serial killer. We've actually talked about two different cases involving serial killers around the same time. In the case of Belle Gunness, she was actually a contemporary of this serial killer. And in the case of the Bloody Benders, they were doing their crimes 10 years before the Austin Servant Girl Annihilator. I think that what makes this case different is the urban setting in which it took place. Daily news, sometimes twice daily news. This allowed for more real-time coverage of the events of the day, including these murders. In addition, I would say that this 
this series of murders had a pretty large impact on society as a whole in Austin and America for the time. But again, I'd like to say it's probably because it happened in such an urban setting, not because this guy was the first. It's difficult to know which victims to attribute to this attacker. For the purposes of this episode not being uh, two hours long, I'm only going to talk about the actual murders and the murders that took place in the city of Austin. Just know that there have been murders attributed to him in San Antonio, other Texas cities, and uh, across the pond. More on that later. And there were lots of crimes against working class Austin women during this time that have at one point or another been attributed to this person. Even though they're horrible, for brevity, we're gonna go ahead and just omit those cases for today. Okay, let's jump back in our time machine and head towards the turn of the century, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas was, as their mayor would say, on the brink of a golden new era. But things were not equal for every member of Austin society. Just two decades out from the Civil War and emancipation, racism ran rampant in Texas as it did throughout the country and was sometimes codified. Though this was before the Jim Crow laws, there were the so-called Black Codes. Segregation laws impacted the everyday life of Black Texans and especially impacted their social mobility. The Ku Klux Klan was present in Texas by 1868, intimidating and assaulting Black people. And yet, racial relations were at sort of a tenuous peace in Austin at the time. Black-owned businesses were on the rise in the city, as well as the influence of Black politicians and churches. Some local bars had even created Black sections within their bar because, well, everybody's money talks the same. At the time, almost every wealthier family in the city of Austin had a servant girl. They were almost always black and in some cases were considered sort of like members of the family. Some were even in family photos. They often lived in servants quarters, which were either small attachments to the actual house or cabins that were on the grounds of the landowner. For $10 a week, Servant women would awake at four o'clock in the morning to change the fires, change the chamber pots, and start breakfast. They would take the kids to school, run all of the family's errands, come home, prepare lunch, clean the house, make dinner, eat what they called servant scraps after dinner, which were simply table scraps, and go to bed, all to wake up in the morning and start again. This for the equivalent of around $300 in today's money a week. What a deal. They sure do sound like a valued member of the family, huh? One such servant girl was 25-year-old Molly Smith. She was born in Virginia in 1857 and was in Texas by the time she was at least 13 years old. She worked in various households in both Austin and Waco, Texas, and had a 10-year-old son named George. He may or may not have been living with her at the time, but because newspapers did not mention him, it's highly likely that he didn't live with her then. According to someone who was interviewed for a newspaper at the time, Molly, quote, possessed a high temper and she had once spoken of killing a man with a bottle, end quote. Take from that what you will. She had been working in the home of an insurance man, W.K. Hall, as a cook for just under a month. She lived with her boyfriend, Walter Spence, in a small apartment that adjoined the kitchen in the main house. There was no lock on the door to the outside of the apartment. It was three o'clock in the morning on December 31st, 1884. Walter stumbled into the bedroom of Tom Chalmers, who was a teenager living in the house, and said, quote, Mr. Tom, for God's sakes, do something to help me. Somebody has nearly killed me, end quote. Tom, seeing the man having been badly beaten, did not decide to help him, but instead told him to go see a doctor? Yeah, okay. Walter did attempt for several hours to go find someone to help him. Not only had he been badly injured, he couldn't find Molly. The next morning, a neighbor servant girl discovered the body of Molly Smith behind an outhouse. She was nearly nude and had been bludgeoned to death with an ax. Signs of a desperate struggle were found in the apartment. 
Walter was quickly eliminated as a suspect for, I mean, the fact that he would have been impossible for him to beat himself as badly as he ended up being beaten up. Molly Smith would be the first victim of the servant girl annihilator. On May 8th, 1885, the Austin Daily Statesman would report on another, quote, deed of deviltry in the crimson catalog of crime, end quote. Eliza Shelley was a black woman working as a cook in the household of Dr. Lucian B. Johnson, another LBJ. She had worked for the family a long time, perhaps even before they moved to Austin. Eliza had been born in 1857, and she lived in the Johnson household with her three children, all under the age of eight. Her husband was a prisoner at the state prison in Huntsville, Texas, and she and her three children lived in a small cabin about 40 or 50 steps from the main house. The small cabin butted up to an alley. When Dr. Johnson, prodded by his distraught wife, entered the cabin, he saw a scene of horror. The room was in great disorder, blood staining the sheets and the pillow on the bed. Two trunks had been broken open and their contents had been scattered around the room. And in the center of the room, Dr. Johnson found the body of Eliza. She had been bludgeoned by an ax to the head. The only clue as to who had done the dastardly deed was a set of shoeless footprints in the sand from the alley to the cabin and back to the alley again. But what about Eliza's children? They were actually there during the crime. Newspaper reporters interviewed the eldest, who was eight at the time, and he said that a man had entered the cabin saying that he was going to go to St. Louis the next day and asking the boy where Eliza's money was. The boy had no idea where his mother's money was. Then the man told him and his siblings to get under the blanket. They did and they were spared. The boy wasn't really able to reliably identify the man. Uh, he was either wearing a white rag or his race was white. It's really unclear. Of course, he was a traumatized eight-year-old, so that makes sense. The first thing Austin police did was to arrest the first shoeless black man they saw. Real solid police work. Turns out that wasn't actually the guy, so they let him go. A poem in the Austin Daily Statesman read, Get thee a gun, O oh servant girl, and keep it by thy bed. Take aim upon the ruffian and fill him full of lead. Indeed, the city was in a full-on panic. Servant women across the city began to stay in their friends' homes, hoping for safety in numbers. They would pile furniture up against the doorway in hopes that that would prevent someone from being able to enter. One black man was heard to say that he never thought he'd leave the house again at night for fear that his wife would be killed. And this was a new kind of killer, remember? It was difficult, if not impossible, for people to really think that this could all have been committed by one person. Serial killers didn't have the name serial killer at the time, and honestly, they weren't even really in the human consciousness. There were no examples even of serial killers in literature yet. It was almost impossible to believe that someone could act so normal during the day and then commit such atrocities at night. And whatever tenuous peace on race relations existed in the city before these attacks definitely ended after them. Immediately, whites began to wholesale blame black people for all of the attacks. A news article from March 14th was titled, quote, bad blacks, a lot of ruffians on the rampage in the capital city, end quote. Suggestions were made to randomly shoot black men with the hopes that if it didn't actually kill the killer, that it would, I don't know, dissuade him from killing anyone else. There were suggestions for citizen patrols to patrol the streets at night. Hmm, sounds familiar. And as the cases continued, Instead of trying to find connections between them, police and inquests would really just search for the nearest, well, black person that was close to the case and arrest them. Some suggested that one murder really caused all black men to enter a frenzy in which they were just murdering people around them. Some even said that it must be the younger black men because 
older black men had been enslaved and slavery was a civilizing force. Right, okay. The San Antonio Express would say that the murderer was, quote, probably a Negro, certainly a man of unorganized intellect and debased nature, end quote. A suggestion was made that they use the newly designed Capitol grounds as a place to lynch black suspects. You didn't think emancipation was the end of racism, did you? I know my audience is smarter than that. Irene Cross, yet another black servant, was 38 years old. She hailed from Mississippi, and at the time of her death, she was already a widow, living in a small two-bedroom house with her adult son and her nephew, who was a child. Her son worked nights as a porter and wasn't home at the time of the crime. On the night of May 22nd, 1885, Mary was stabbed and nearly scalped by someone her young nephew would describe as, quote, a big chunky Negro man, barefooted and with his pants rolled up, end quote. She staggered into the yard and her screams awakened her employer who came out and called for a doctor. The doctor evidently arrived after the newspaper reporter. 1800s were a wild time, y'all. Irene Cross would die soon after. And now the crime that requires Mexican martinis, maybe three. Mary Ramey was born in Austin in 1875. Her father had died just a few months before her birth. Her mother, Rebecca Ramey, was her primary caregiver, though she had an older brother and an older sister and a pretty close extended family. This extended family included her grandmother, Harriet, and her uncle, Edward, who opened one of the first black businesses in Austin, the Carrington Grocery Store on Pecan Street. Rebecca worked as a cook and did not have any romantic interests at the time. On Sunday, August 30th, 1885, somewhere between four o'clock and five o'clock a.m., a man entered the kitchen where Rebecca and Mary were sleeping. He hit Rebecca hard enough with an object to actually fracture her skull. He then dragged little Mary into an adjoining washroom, sexually assaulted her, and stabbed a metal object through both of her ears. Sorry. Bloodhounds initially followed another set of tracks of bare feet running away from the house, but they weren't able to actually track that down to any suspect. Yet another unsolved murder and the horror exponentially increasing. Orange Washington, yes, his name is Orange, was the eldest son of George and Mary. And though he was born in Virginia, his family were shown to be working on a farm in Brenham, Texas by 1870. He rented a small cabin at 24th and Guadalupe Street. Yeah, Austinites call it Guadalupe instead of Guadalupe. Let's, let's not go into any more details there. He moved into that cabin with his girlfriend, Gracie Vance. Gracie was born to parents Eliza and Charles in 1865. She'd had a brief marriage to a railroad worker before getting together with Orange. And in probably what is my favorite quote of the newspapers of the era, quote, was living with Orange Washington without resorting to the formality of legal marriage, end quote. Gracie and Orange were murdered in their home on the night of September 28th. 1885. Two other girls, friends of Gracie and Orange, were injured but not murdered. They had all been sleeping at Orange's cabin, ironically as an added form of protection against the midnight assassin. All of them had been attacked by an axe. One of the surviving girls believed that a local black man, Doc Woods, was responsible for the murders, but he was also later cleared. Well-known Austin resident William Sidney Porter, who you might know as O. Henry, wrote a letter to a friend in 1885 saying, quote, Town is fearfully dull except for the frequent raids of the servant girl annihilators who make things lively during the dead of night, end quote. Evidently, he wasn't scared of being murdered, but that's where the killer gets his name, even if O. Henry, like everyone else during the time, believed that there was more than one killer servant girl annihilate tours. After the murders of Gracie and Orange, things in town settled. The raids, as O'Henry called them, stopped. Despite the fact that Austin only had 12 police officers and some of them worked part-time, 
people began to believe that those hard scrapping detectives had either forced the killer out of town or he'd been arrested. Austinites began to ramp up for the holiday season. 45 year old Susan Clementine Staggs was born in Alabama. She had married Moses, a Confederate war veteran and a man 10 years her senior. They had two daughters, Lena and Ida. Susan was a little different from the previous women we talked about. She was an upper class white woman. On the evening of December 24th, 1885, an intruder entered the Hancock home. Lena and Ida were at a Christmas party and Susan was asleep in one of the girls' beds. The intruder struck Susan in the head and dragged her into the backyard. Moses actually woke up and managed to chase the intruder off, but Susan died three days later. As always, they were looking for the closest person to be the suspect, so Moses was the first suspect and he was arrested. The first case against him was dropped, but he was eventually rearrested and tried for the crime. Susan's brother, William, testified that Moses was an alcoholic and he was violent with Susan. Susan's sister painted a slightly better picture, but did say that he was known to curse a Susan when he was drunk. Lena, the couple's 16-year-old daughter, would also testify on behalf of her father, saying, quote, Papa always treated Mama kindly and never whipped us girls in our lives, end quote. Moses would eventually be cleared for this murder in a stunning revelation on the exact same Christmas Eve evening. Less than an hour after the first attack, 17-year-old Eula Phillips was murdered in her home, drenching her 18-month-old son's night clothes in blood. Both Eula and her husband, 21-year-old James, had been bludgeoned in their son's bedroom. Eula was dragged into the backyard, sexually assaulted, and died in a pool of her own blood. Eula was also an upper-class white woman. James, despite being severely wounded himself, was tried and convicted for Eula's murder. That conviction would later be overturned by the Texas State Court of Appeals. The murders would end just as quickly and mysteriously as they had started, less than a year earlier. The Austin police arrested over 400 people in connection with these cases, which amounts to over a person per day. Some did begin to theorize that the murders were connected, but that theory didn't really take hold until a few years later, 1888, when another series of murders captivated the world. Jack the Ripper. Some theorized then and still theorize today that Jack the Ripper and the Servant Girl Annihilator are one and the same. Spoiler alert, they're, they're not. They're not. Literally the only thing that's the same is nothing. <laughs> the, the timeline is the only thing that lines up. Everything else, totally different. They're not the same. And there are some theories about particular Austinites who may have committed these crimes, but the evidence is super sparse. It's so sparse, in fact, that some have suggested that there was even a cover-up, either by the Austin Police Department or the government or somebody else. But I'll let you come to your own conclusions if you decide to do your own digging. It seems unlikely or even impossible that these murders were committed by someone who knew the victim. Almost all of the crimes actually included a living eyewitness and they were unable to identify either someone by face or if they were wearing a disguise or a mask, someone by the sound of their voice. I do believe that all of these crimes are connected and honestly, even though there wasn't time to talk about them, a lot of the crimes that were just attacks, I believe they're also connected. And I, I believe that it was the same killer. The first of the victims had similar victimologies, women, and men only if they got in the way, and the children were left unharmed. All of the victims were left out in the open to be easily discovered. Most of the crime scenes had shoeless footprints around them, which indicates that somebody went barefoot in order to approach more quietly. I believe he was white, and I believe he attacked both the victims of convenience and used weapons of convenience. The one victim that's a little different in the initial crimes is Mary Ramey, the 11 year old. I believe he only targeted her because her mom was, was husky. She was a bigger lady. He had approached probably wanting to attack a woman, 
But once he got in there and realized he couldn't drag Rebecca anywhere, he he went for the, the nearest victim nearby, Mary. I believe that in most cases he used an ax because most houses in that time period had an ax for splitting wood. Otherwise, he just used whatever he could get a hold of. And I use the word he because several of the eyewitnesses did describe him as a he and also many of the victims were sexually assaulted. And what kind of serial killer was he? I believe that the Servant Girl Annihilator was a hedonistic serial killer. These types of killers are attracted to and compelled by the thrill of it. This could be for financial gain or sexual gratification or just because it's exciting. When the thrill wore off for black women, this man started to target a group that was riskier, white women. So what do you think? Who do you think could have possibly had both motive and opportunity to commit all of these crimes? Do you think the typical serial killer markers are evident in this case? Or is this one of these examples of us trying to find patterns in something that doesn't exist? Could the Servant Girl Annihilator actually be Jack the Ripper? For those of you who are Jack the Ripper aficionados, which I know there are some on here. And honestly, even if the crime may someday be solved, does it even matter? It's not like the criminal will ever be brought to justice. He's been dead for a hundred years. Why are we obsessed with crime and unsolved murders from hundreds of years ago? Why are we obsessed with true crime at all? You know what? Don't answer that one. Irene, Molly, and Eliza were buried in the so-called colored section of the Oakwood Cemetery. This is the oldest city-owned cemetery in Austin. A once isolated site, it is now located in the center of the city, just east of I-35, the de facto dividing line of the town. Mary's mother, Rebecca, moved in with her daughter, Mary's older sister, on the east side of town. An 1888 newspaper article would say that Rebecca had, quote, never recovered from the shock and the wounds of that terrible night of blood. Yeah, I can imagine not. Rebecca died in February of 1909. The city of Austin spent the equivalent of $4.7 million in today's money to install those moon towers all across the city. This happened in 1894, but some say it was a direct result of the murders that had happened just under 10 years earlier. Jim Crow laws were welcomed in Austin sooner than in other parts of the country. And by 1928, the city of Austin had developed a plan to separate the actual city in two, segregating blacks and whites on either side of I-35, thereby ensuring that segregation would be codified and permanent. The consequences of the Midnight Assassin's reign of terror would be felt for generations to come. Austin today has a lot of parallels to the Austin of 1885. Tesla, Google, Facebook, these are just some of hundreds of companies that have found their way to Silicon Hills, Austin's answer to Silicon Valley. St. Edwards, Houston Tillotson, and the University of Texas educate thousands of young people each year. And they may look a lot different, but a lot of people can be seen riding modern day velocipeds all around town, doing their part to keep Austin weird. Here's hoping that the new wave of modernity doesn't bring another monster in the dark. I wanna give a plug for a couple of sources that I heavily used in today's episode. Skip Hollinsworth, who some of you may remember from the Bernie episode, he's the true crime writer for the Texas Monthly. And he actually wrote a book called The Midnight Assassin, which I'll link in the description box below. And he also wrote an article for Texas Monthly about the Servant Girl Annihilator. I heavily sourced both of those articles and he's done some great talks that you can find on YouTube as well. Skip is a great modern true crime author, if you ask me. He's got the kind of devil in the white city vibe to what he writes. So I highly recommend you checking him out. And it's probably because I live in Austin, but I was able to snag a copy of The Servant Girl Murders by J.R. Galloway, which is really just a compilation of all of the newspaper articles transcribed that discuss this case. Really super helpful resource. And as you, as you heard, I really heavily referenced it throughout the episode. Also linked below. Thanks for hanging out with me. 
I hope that you enjoyed this crime. Maybe it was new to you. Definitely one of my favorites of all time. It's so hard to do serial killers. I never feel like I do the crimes or the victims any justice because there's just, well, so many of them. Maybe you can let me know what you think. And great news, Marks and Mayhem fans. We're actually now at Marks and Mayhem on every social media site, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So you can go to any of those platforms, type in Marks and Mayhem as one word and spell out the word and, and you'll find us. Oh, and if you're not watching on YouTube, would you mind heading over there and maybe liking a video or 10 and hitting that subscribe button? And if you haven't reviewed me on your favorite podcast listening app, I'd really appreciate it if you would. I have some really big growth goals for 2022 and I need your help to reach them. Next week, we hop across the pond for another fascinating French case. And we dive into the mixing of alcoholic drinks again by mixing a margarita and a French 75. Make sure you check out the ingredients in the description box below and pick them up on your next trip to the liquor store. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to murder.